Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to this uh, session about saving teeth. And I, as I was preparing it, I was thinking about the children that would think, well, why are dentists even discussing about saving teeth? Isn't this what dentistry is all about? And I think it's uh, delightful to be able to do it. Now, I need to offer you the apologies of Dr. Cortellini, who is unable to come for family reason. And uh, he has, however, sent his presentation uh, by video recording because he wanted to be sure to be here with us. So please, let's start that. Dear colleagues, good morning. Apologies for not being with you in presence. I couldn't really come. I'll try to do my best from abroad. Our issue today is periodontitis and uh, our problem is uh, to save or extract and eventually replace teeth. In a common treatment plan, in most of our perio patients, eventually, most of the teeth will be treated and retained, some extracted. Our focus is to try to save as many teeth as possible. These are data from my private practice in Firenze to have pictures of the relative proportion of teeth saved and retained or extracted during treatment and over time. I have analyzed the period between January 2001 and December 2017. As you can see, we have intake in almost 6,000 patients. More than one third were perio patients that uh, required step one and two of periodontal treatment. 1,846 teeth were extracted during uh, active therapy. Uh, this is uh, uh, about 3.5% of the total amount of teeth in uh, perio patients. Perio surgery was uh, necessary in 1,450 patients involving more than uh, 6,000 teeth. 1,419 teeth presenting with deep pockets and severe bone defects or vocations in 50, 574 patients were treated with periodontal regeneration. This uh, represents a 2.7% of the teeth in perio patients that otherwise could have taken a very different, less favorable route. Long term, 97.5% of the regenerated teeth were still in function. Overall, only 3.1% of the teeth in perio patients needed extraction. So we try to save and retain teeth over time. Personally, I am on service to this uh, aim for 39 years, applying the most advanced periodontal armamentarium in my practice, including, of course, periodontal regeneration, being uh, frequently the only approach to save severe condition. This is my first uh, uh, case uh, treated with periodontal regeneration along with my mentor, Professor Giampi. Pini Prata, and you see the severity of the case. The one year resolution with bone regrowth, but with uh, mucogingival problems. The application of a free gingival graft in some way to take care of it. And the extraordinary evolution of the case after 39 years, you see the incredible healing of the bone tissues and of the mucogingival complex. 
Since then, with Maurizio Tonetti and Gian Pepini Pranto, we have devoted part of our time to what I would call stepwise clinical research in the regenerative field and published many papers that apparently were highly appreciated by the scientific community as highlighted in this bibliometric study of the top cited papers on regeneration. The three of our group, Cortellini, Piniprato, and Tonetti, are in the first top five authors with a total of 37 top cited papers. <coughs> These papers constitute the backbone of the evidence-based periodontal regeneration, aiming at improving efficacy, efficiency, and predictability. We have so far proposed three steps of therapy. Step one being patient preparation. Patients should uh, have a very low levels of plaque, very low levels of uh, residual inflammation, be non-smokers with very high level of compliance and uh, healthy from a systemical standpoint. Step two is represented by site preparation. The key point to apply regeneration are <clears throat> take care of the endo conditions, try to reduce as much as possible the bacterial burden and the inflammation on the site to be treated with regeneration, and uh, keep the tooth stable if there is some mobility by splinting. Then uh, we can apply the surgical approach. Step three is the surgical approach. Indeed, the selection of the surgical approach is uh, upon the accurate evaluation of the site and uh, the defect morphology. We have uh, to detect uh, the width of the interdental space, the depth of the defect, the width of the defect, the defect anatomy in terms of residual bony walls and uh, the defect extension. Using this information, we choose uh, the papilla incision first. We'll apply an horizontal buckle incision according to the modified papilla preservation technique in wide interproximal spaces. We'll apply the diagonal buckle incision according to the simplified papilla preservation flare in narrow interproximal spaces. Then uh, we take care of the flap design that might be very extended in ample and very severe defects or minimal invasive in more limited defects. Then we go through the selection of regenerative material among uh, EMD, bone substitute and barriers or combination thereof. Finally, primary intention closure of the wound with internal mattress sutures. The 2019 guidelines for periodontal therapy strongly recommend the application of periodontal regeneration and the adoption of papilla preservation flap to deep pockets associated with intrabony defects and the application of regeneration to teeth with class two patients. We will make now a short walk in the world of the intrabony defects. We can apply regeneration to mono-rooted and multi-rooted teeth with the defects of different depths. This is a deep defect involving the mid-third of the root of this uh, cuspid. Here we see applied uh, the modified minimal invasive surgery with uh, the elevation of a tiny buccal flap lifted to bone crest, the granulation under the papilla that is not uh, elevated, after debridement, after eventually application of uh, uh, regenerative material, we get uh, the primary intention closure. Here you have uh, the pre-operative and the intraoperative condition. 
The one year resolution of the pocket and almost complete feel of the intramonic component. And uh, the fantastic uh, improvement of both bone and mucogingiva complex after 10 years. This is a very deep defect involving uh, the apical third of the root. There is a severe clinical attachment and bone loss. The tooth is stable, so we don't need the splint. The tooth is vital and will remain vital. Intra-surgical uh, uh, shots uh, with primary intention closure and the almost complete uh, resolution of the defect at one year. And here you have uh, the further improvement uh, through time and uh, the 10 year radiograph and photograph. This is an even deeper defect to the apex. Again, we have a very severe attachment and bone loss, but here we have a very high mobility. The tooth is vital. So what we do, we stabilize the tooth with a splint. We don't uh, treat endodontically the tooth keeping it vital. You see the severity of the condition in, uh, during surgery. And here you have uh, the complete resolution of the intrabonic component. At one year, the splint has been removed. This is a great improvement in function. And here you have uh, highlighted the 12 years follow-up with the absolute stability of the outcome. We can indeed apply regeneration to multi-rooted teeth without vocation involvement. This is a case with the mesial and the distal defect involving the coronal and the mid-third of the root of this uh, first lower left molar. The intraoperative uh, photograph shows to you three walls, treated with amelogenesis alone and the complete resolution after one year and the absolute stability after 12 years. Also here note the maturation of the papillae along with the growth of bone underneath. This deep defect involving the mid-third of the root uh, is uh, shown in a small clip. Again, uh, you see the application of modified minimal invasive surgery, debridement, uh, removal of the granulation, application of uh, hand and sonic instruments, application of EDTA. Then uh, the internal mattress uh, modified immediately before placing EMD, EMD application. And uh, finally, primary intention closure of the flare. After five years, complete resolution of the intrabony component absolute stability and the maturation of the soft tissues at 10 years. You see better the maturation of the soft tissues without the probe. Look the difference between baseline and 10 years. We have indeed demonstrated recently in a randomized control clinical trial awarded by AAP that teeth treated with a generation and maintained with, uh, within a supportive periodontal care program can survive up to 20 years. This is a scroll with some examples of that experimental population. You have some of these uh, very severe conditions uh, from baseline to the 20 year follow up in mono and multi rooted teeth in the upper and in the lower jaw. We've also demonstrated the possibility to apply regeneration to teeth that uh, conventionally we declare hopeless. In this randomized control clinical trial awarded twice by AAP, we selected 50 hopeless teeth. 25 were allocated to extraction and replacement, 25 to periodontal regeneration. After 10 years, uh, we have uh, published a follow-up of this uh, LCT. This is a case in which uh, the tooth was extracted and replaced with an implant. It's not an easy implant. After extraction, we, have to, we had to wait uh, three months, then place an implant uh, with the bow regeneration, then expose the implant, then apply a provisional, then apply a definitive, and the outcome is nice. This is another case with the tooth extracted and replaced with the bridge. Also here, we have to do something. 
pre-built uh, the deficient dentulous ridge with mucogingival surgery, condition the tissue with the provision for a long period of time, after one year, apply the definitive bridge. And this is a nice outcome after 10 years. This is one uh, of the cases treated with uh, periodontal regeneration. You have the baseline uh, condition, very severe uh, bone loss, tooth has been splinted for the very high mobility, has been endodontically treated as well. And here you have uh, the intrasurgical, very severe condition, treated with a bioresolved barrier. And uh, after 10 years, the incredible resolution of the bone defect, the tooth has been desplinted, and now is working as a single uh, unit with a function and no mobility. Here a molar with the major root completely out of bone, vital, defect beyond the apex, stable because of the distal root, no fucation involved. Of course, before surgery, we have to treat endodontically these tooth because we have to instrument the apex. The incredible amount of bone regrowth at one year and the stability after 10 years. How do we do it? Following the three steps. Step one, control of patient factors, low levels of plaque and bleeding, no smoke, compliance, systemic condition. Second, control of the side factors. If uh, there is mobility, splint. Check vitality and apply endo when necessary. Check the presence of infection and try to remove as much as possible the burden of bacteria from the site to be regenerated. Then apply sophisticated surgery. And this is a small clip of, that, of one of these hopeless teeth. But you see the application of the modified papilla preservation technique, lifting a rather ample buccal flap. The flap has to be ample because the defect is enormous. The intrasolcular lingual incision, lifting the papillae through the interproximal spaces, now starting the debridement. And here you see the, completely, the complete destruction of bone. The buccal bone plate is gone. All the bone is gone. The tooth is flying in the empty space. Accurate debridement of the root surface, then uh, application also of EDTA. This case was treated with a combination of uh, uh, bioresorbable collagen barriers, bovine bone mineral, that was delivered on, uh, uh, all around and covered with a second barrier on top of the back and side. Then uh, uh, the buccal flap has been uh, uh, split thickness uh, uh, treated to uh, gain mobility and close the primary tension with the absence of any tension within uh, internal mattress sutures. The baseline and the intra-op condition of this case, and uh, after one year, the uh, consistent amount of uh, uh, mineral tissue around uh, the root surface. The tooth has been in orthodontically intruded, then uh, aesthetically treated with restorative dentistry. And this is uh, the condition after 10 years. Consistent uh, bone mineral around the root and uh, quite nice uh, aesthetics. And here I have uh, a very recent shot. This is a shot of one month ago, showing the 20 year follow up of this case. And uh, on the radiograph, you clearly see uh, the uh, impact of time on the root surface. This requires some intervention now. This is the proxa brush uh, impact. The clinical outcome of this study is very clear. We started with 25 teeth declared hopeless, with uh, a very deep pockets, a very uh, great amount of bone loss. We gained a lot of attachment to the bone. And after one year, we could declare 23 out of 25 teeth favorable in prognosis. Two teeth did not end up in a favorable uh, outcome, and I was forced uh, to extract 
those two T's. Then all the rest uh, went into a stringent uh, supportive periodontal care program and uh, that granted stability over time to the remaining teeth. At eight years, we lost another tooth for a trauma, but was lost. So at the end of uh, the matter, 88% of the baseline hopeless teeth were still in function after 10 years. Teeth vocation involvement can also benefit uh, greatly of the regenerative approach. What is common uh, treated in uh, uh, in the site of uh, class two vocation is uh, the uh, so-called keyhole uh, vocation uh, involvement. In the keyhole, uh, the application of the flap is very clear and the buckle vocation, we lift a full thickness buckle flap then eventually make a periosteal fenestration. This is the intra-op uh, image of the uh, debrided vocation with the flap elevated. And then uh, the post-operative uh, coronal advancement of the flap after uh, inclusion of regenerative materials. And here you have the five years resolution, complete resolution of the vocation and the stability of the gingival margin. However, I'd like to underline especially our contribution to the treatment of vocation associated with intrabony defects. With a novel approach, based on the application of a papilla preservation flap or minimal invasive surgery to grow vertical periodontal support and eventually influence the, the vocation. If the vocation is allocated within the intrabony component, we have a very high chances to close the vocation. We have applied uh, uh, this uh, approach in 26 mandibular models, 23 with class uh, two and three with class three, as you see here. At one year, eight were in class zero and 15 in class one. And there was a, quite an interesting stability over time. In the 23 maxillary molars, 20 were in class two and three in class three. And after one year, 16 were in class zero and three in class one with a stability over time. Survival was 100% in the upper jaw, 92% in lower jaw. Lower jaw, we lost two teeth. Why so? Because of mobility. These molars were, had quite a, an amount of mobility and we were unable to control mobility. So you understand how important it is to grant the stability to teeth for regeneration. Show to you a case of uh, a multi-rooted tooth and the drawing of uh, the access flap based on the application of papilla preservation flap and minimal invasive surgery with uh, a vertical releasing incision on the palatal side to open up the vision through the mesial palatal vocation. A small clip to have an idea. Uh, this is the vocation involvement. We start from the buccal side with the linear horizontal incision through the papilla, intrasolcular short, very short incision. We lift uh, a full thickness, uh, very tiny buckle flap. Then we work uh, under the papilla to isolate uh, the papilla from the granulation, go to the palatal side, intrasolcular incision, and uh, followed by uh, a vertical releasing incision to help uh, the lift of the palatal flap and the vision of the vocation. Palatal flap elevation, papilla elevation, very carefully. You see the papilla coming through uh, in a very swift way. Degranulation, debridement with q reds and uh, sonic instruments. Very handy, the application of a micro mirror to see the condition of the roof application of diamond coated tips, and uh, again, the micro mirror to see if uh, everything is clearly debrided. Then we apply the modified internal mattress uh, suture before the application of the biomaterial. This is done in this way to be able to apply the suture without uh, uh, having uh, blood and materials around so you can uh, aspirate and wash carefully. Then we apply EDTA, wash and dry, apply amelogenins, and apply 
bovine bone mineral. We reallocate uh, the papilla and we are ready for the wound closure. Primary intention wound, clo wound closure and uh, as a final uh, surgical uh, issue, uh, the suturing of the vertical release incision. So this was baseline. This is uh, the complete resolution of the intrabone and closure defecation after one year. A case uh, uh, more severe with the subclass C, very deep intraboni on a second molar and a 13 year follow up showing the complete resolution of the intraboni, the complete uh, closure defecation and the very nice stability over time. This is indeed uh, applicable to the lower jaw. This is a class two subclass C, very severe infraboni, very severe fucation, application of EMD, primary intention closure, resolution after one year. This uh, case ended up with the class one uh, uh, residual fucation and remain stable up to 10 years. I wanna end up my presentation with a very severe case. Class three, subclass C with a distal root of this molar completely out of bubble. Here we have also a very severe mucogingival condition. We have uh, a deep gingival recession, very little KT. The tooth is vital, but is very stable due to the mesial damage. So of course we have to apply endo, uh, endo uh, treatment before surgery. This is the intrasurgical condition. And you see the severity of the lesion was treated with amelogenin alone. And here you have the sequence from baseline to one year. And here you see the impressive growth of bone after one year. At one year, I decided to apply a free gingival graft, not for aesthetics, of course, but to increase the ability and the possibility of the patients to clean and see what happens. In five years, uh, there was the almost complete resolution of the intraboni and the fucation and the maturation of uh, the mucogingival complex. And this uh, came even better after 10 years. This is uh, an extreme example of how far we could go with the periodontal regeneration. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, with this, uh, I can uh, uh, have Mauricio uh, ending up uh, the presentation with uh, considerations that uh, will entertain everybody in uh, the interest. So what I think is important is to realize uh, that we as dentists in our daily activities are trying to achieve this technical excellence and that in this type of situation, in these congresses, we want to learn the evidence, the science and the clinical tips to be able to do it. However, what I think is important is uh, to make sure that we do not forget uh, as we are the little laborers who provide society with the ability to retain a natural dentition, we need to make sure that we uh, are aware of what we are doing for society and for the people. So in my presentation, what I would like to do is actually um, start a little bit from a public health vision why is it important to retain teeth, to retain dentitions, especially at a time in which people are tempted uh, you know, to make people edentulous? And uh, when we talk about economics, uh, there are economic perspectives that pertain particularly to the individual, to the patient who needs to make choices. And... Uh, what I think is important to realize that this is only one of the dimensions because the other is uh, the social aspect. Why are we doing all of this? Now, the original plan was that uh, Sandro and I will alternate with uh, 
the uh, socio-economic aspects and with the how, but we have already seen how we can do it. And I think it's an example which is stunning, it's motivational, it has been motivational for myself and for all of our students and friends. Now, what is the issue? The issue is that over the course of life, we as dentists are essentially uh, confronted with two diseases. And these two diseases lead to tooth loss, and at the end, they lead to edentulism. Now, we are frequently focused on the disease aspect and uh, sometimes forget that once the disease goes beyond a certain level, it starts actually causing disability in our patients and perhaps in the later stages even through handicap. Um, so I think it's important that the two fields, public health and clinical dentistry, come better together so that uh, we reinforce each other in, uh, in our need. Now, governments uh, like to look at things a little bit in a different way compared to us. For example, as uh, put very, very nicely in this uh, uh, global burden of disease uh, uh, study, um, what is important for governments is not so much how much disease is around, but what is the impact of this disease? Perhaps by looking at parameters like years lived with disability, and while we like to proudly say, well, caries is number one, a severe periodontitis is number six, what is actually important is to look that severe periodontitis and tooth loss actually have a very major impact on uh, um, years lived with disability. So with some of the parameters that are looked at by government. Uh, how to do things um, is pretty clear. We are very fortunate that today we have uh, guidelines and having scientifically based guidelines, I think, is a, is a major step forward for our field because it gives us an idea of how these things can be addressed and what, what should be the path. Now, as clinicians and as scientists, we usually we focus on efficacy and effectiveness. And many times we forget the efficiency because there is always a dirty aspect to money because we think about the money that comes in our pocket. But the, the issue of efficiency is, uh, is very important because in a health system, in a country, what we must realize is that there is no new money created. And it's a question of where resources are being allocated. So we must realize that efficiency is important. Now, we don't know very much uh, what we mean, so bear me with me for just one minute. So we can think about efficiency as a, a, a plot between cost and the health benefits that we can get through a treatment. And we can think that there is a specific spot in this plot, which is where our standard of care is. And as we develop newer uh, techniques, newer approaches, these will, are going to be placed in different areas, perhaps with things being less costly uh, but less effective. Are we happy with it? And usually the question is how much less effective to get a saving are we willing to accept? Now, industry usually brings us to the upper right quadrant with different alternatives that are usually more expensive and usually also more effective. Sometimes, however, we go in the wrong quadrant because we may be asked to pay more for something that delivers less, which is, I would say, not such a great idea, like in treatment five. And 
Ideally, we would like to be able to get more pain less. So what is the pain and what is the gain of the equation? We can look at it in different ways, perhaps with a narrow periodontal vision, how many euros or dollars or whatever are we willing to pay for an extra millimeter of pocket reduction attachment level gain, or how many euros, dollars are we willing to pay to retain a tooth or the dentition an extra year. So Sandro has shown us some of these studies that are just a proof of principle studies. Because in this 20 year follow-up study with 45 patients, what we see is just some, uh, some ideas, some paths. Here we compare free treatment in terms of efficacy. And the free treatment are compared are the conventional, the access flap, and different way of doing a regeneration. And here we look the health benefit in terms of how much attachment gain are we getting. Now, this is important, but it's not the full picture because it is missing the cost and the approach that it, you know, the effort that was necessary to get there. So we have started doing analysis of our trials that include mean cumulative cost of recurrence. So how much does it cost from the moment the patient comes in to the moment uh, uh, of the end of our trials to maintain a tooth or maintain a dentition? And you see that uh, if we look at maintenance after treatment, there are treatments that require more cost and other that requires less. But if we also put the cost of the initial treatment, regeneration being more expensive, we see that the uh, balance of cost becomes different. With regenerative treatment, we need to invest more and we need less later on, while with other approaches, the cost is more distributed over time. Now, uh, Sandro has uh, shown us this type of cases. What can we, go, uh, can we do with these uh, stage 3 periodontitis patients and how can we manage the situation? And essentially, what uh, he has shown to us uh, is that it is possible to to treat this type of uh, cases. He showed this one in particular, which I think is absolutely stunning. But I would like to discuss with you what are the da data, the number, the economic number behind it in terms of survival of the teeth, as it did, complication-free survival. The patient wants to know how long until I need to do something about it. And then looking at the concerns of the patient at the beginning and over time, perhaps in terms of chewing function and aesthetics with regeneration or in the extraction group and with uh, aesthetics and in the regeneration and extraction group. Now, we can also look at uh, the cost of recurrence, and you see it uh, here on the left for the regenerative treatment, and we can look at uh, patient satisfaction with the treatment, and you see a lot of green and a lot of blue, which is high levels of satisfaction. And then we can look at the cost of uh, uh, actually doing the tooth replacement. And this is very revealing, you know, the cost all of a sudden is twice as much. And do patients become more satisfied with this type of treatment? And the answer is not really. So a cheaper treatment that also has the benefit of retention of the natural dentition seems to be much more effective. Now, we can look at the whole thing also in terms of um, uh, stage 4 periodontitis. I will just move very quickly. Um, this is the structure of the stage 4 periodontitis guidelines that were presented uh, yesterday. 
And, uh, you know, the, the whole idea is that uh, we want to manage periodontitis, treat, which means save teeth, then we want to restore, which means replace missing teeth and loss function, and then we want to preserve dentition and quality of life for a lifetime, if possible. This is what we want to do. There are different clusters that we identified in the workshop. I don't go into the details, but what I want to make as a point is that usually when we get to stage four periodontitis, the technical needs, the cost of treating these patients, placing uh, dental implants is, is very, very high. And this is one of the reasons why in the European Union, it has been estimated that dentistry is actually the third more expensive um, health condition that needs to be managed, more expensive than cancer or dementia. And this is really one of the problems, the fact that we let uh, disease accumulate, become very, very severe, and at the end of the game, uh, it, it is almost prohibitive in cost. So society, and these are data from Italy, spends a lot for dentistry. In Italy, 9 billion euros per year. Only 44% of the population has access to this expense. But very importantly, half of this money is spent in the wrong way to replace teeth that have been missed. If we look at the cost for preventive services, only 9%, the cost for advanced periodontal treatment, only 4.5%, which means that we need to rebalance allocation. This is really what is critically important. And this is uh, the situation in China, this is the health system that uh, I am now trying to help and to tackle with a very high burden of disease. And uh, with the European Federation of Periodontology, we have addressed uh, with this uh, study with the Economist Intelligent, U Intelligence Unit, which are the best way to deal with uh, periodontitis. Looking at different scenarios from the business as usual to the uh, elimination of gingivitis, scenario three, or to uh, managing 90% of periodontitis, scenario four. A lot of outcomes were considered, a lot of assumption, a lot of limitations in this study. But what I think is important is that this study looked at return on investment from a government standpoint. So if a government decides to put $1, one euro, one rimbimbi, is it getting more money back or less? So the answer is that the elimination of gingivitis has, uh, is the best buy scenario with the best return on, on investment, positive return on investment. Treatment of periodontitis provides the best health gains, but it has the highest cost, but still it has a positive return on investment. So what does it mean? It means that in this equation of saving teeth, actually we can intervene in two big areas. We can intervene with the prevention, eliminating gingivitis in order to prevent periodontitis. It is a long-term approach, but it will take a lot of time to give health benefits. But what do we do with the people that uh, are here, that are losing the teeth? And uh, the good thing is that even this portion is cost uh, effective, it has a positive return on investment. So the conclusions of this discussion actually is very simple. Saving teeth is the only sustainable policy when it comes to healthcare. Um, and the first element of saving is, of course, prevention of disease. Then uh, early diagnosis, self-detection is going to be critical. And it's today, as we have seen from Sandro, technically pos uh, possible to save hopeless teeth. 
So I really thank Sandstar for this opportunity to discuss uh, this vision that uh, Sandro and I have been sharing for many years. And uh, really, all the best. And now we are going to transition to the uh, ceremony of the award of the Sandstar uh, Awards. And I let uh, Rachel to come to the podium. Thank you.